We're working on solving problems for which there isn't an existing solution. So we're really pushing the frontier over here. What my team and I are doing over here at ACT is at really the cutting edge of what's being done in the field at large uh, when it comes to the use of AI in, in education. That's Saad Khan, the Director of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning for ACT Next. You're listening to the ACT Next Navigator podcast. I'm Adam Burke. Today's episode is brought to you by Sphinx. Are you looking for automated passage generation? Sphinx encodes text data to automate summarization, sentence recommendation, paraphrasing, and more. Sphinx, the natural language processor for creating English passages quickly. Find out more about Sphinx at actnext.org. We're talking about AI and ML today with Saad Khan. What is AI? Where is it going? Where did it come from? Welcome to the show, Saad. Can you tell us a little about yourself? I'm Saad Khan, and I lead the AI and machine learning team within ACT Next. What myself and what my team do is uh, building out a new generation of learning and measurement systems that help us address our educational needs. Um, We're talking about building tools that can help us uh, measure complex competencies like communication ability, collaborative problem solving, abilities uh, for which it's hard to come up with a traditional form of measurement or assessment, for instance, a paper and pencil test, or even self-assessments, for instance, rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, are you a a good team player or what have you. Those kinds of measures tend to have um, subjective biases at times and don't necessarily scale up or transfer well from one context to the other. Uh, What I believe is a better way to approach that problem is to have um, people demonstrate those complex skills and abilities in an ecologically valid fashion, as in in the real world, and have computer systems be able to actually extract from those performances valid evidence uh, that could be used to draw inferences about their abilities or skill gaps. That's where the AI and machine learning comes into play. I mean, we can certainly have human experts perform that role, but uh, once again, you know, we have the issue of potentially uh, subjective biases uh, or the fact that it's going to be hard to scale that up. But uh, computer systems can replicate the processes, uh, particularly AI, machine learning-based systems, can replicate those uh, human expert processes uh, to be able to really provide uh, a transparent and repeatable way um, to be able to draw the same kind of inferences that uh, human experts would on these complex skills. We also work on uh, addressing some challenges like uh, how do we automate or semi-automate tasks like creating new educational content, which very much is, uh, to this point, being a manual labor-intensive process. So how do we use uh, state-of-the-art in natural language understanding to be able to create new items, for instance, that could go into new assessments or create new content that could be used for comprehension analysis or perhaps even create multimodal content. And by that, I mean not just content which is in the form of uh, text, but it could be video, it could be audio and so forth. We have a rather large um, charter or or purview uh, in which we operate. The team has been making some really exciting progress on the multiple fronts over the last couple of years. And so AI, ML, deep learning, how do you explain the differences or how would you explain it to someone who doesn't know AI and ML and, and some of the different fields? Absolutely. And thank you for asking that question because many times there are misunderstandings um, outside the communities of researchers and developers who are deeply involved in the state of the art and the progress being made in AI. In fact, the way I would describe them is that uh, machine learning and deep learning uh, themselves are 
facets or subfields within AI. Mm -hmm. AI being uh, more of a, uh, the umbrella term for a variety of different ways in which we're trying to make uh, machines demonstrate intelligent behavior or what would seem to us as uh, uh, solving tasks that would require human-like uh, intelligence. Generally speaking, the more accepted description of AI is um, having computer systems that can perceive their environments to distill from that perception actionable knowledge uh, that can be stored away and then applied in a variety of new different contexts to achieve a particular goal that might be set for that computer system or computer agent. The bigger goal in AI, which is sometimes called general AI, is to replicate human-like uh, intelligence uh, in a variety of different uh, complex problems. Mm -hmm. AI, a field which began way back in, in, in the 50s, um, has had multiple cycles of uh, boom and bust, if you will, and many, many uh, examples of successes having commercial and industrial applications and going through multiple rounds of development phases focused on different aspects of AI. Machine learning is a particular kind of artificial intelligence which is heavily data-driven. And the idea with machine learning is um, to be able to look for and identify patterns in data that can actually be used to create, help us create models which are predictive in nature. Okay. So that in the future, if you receive data which is different from the data that was used to learn the pattern in the first place, can we use those models to be able to make predictive decision uh, as to what that data actually means? Okay. It's hard to describe what algorithms are doing as they're kind of changing themselves, I think. Can you talk about the black box? From a very technical perspective, I think there is uh, something, uh, this is a legitimate issue uh, when we have machine learning or uh, based AI systems, particularly the, the new generation of machine learning, which is deep learning, where we're talking about building incredibly complex mathematical models that can have on the order of hundreds of millions of various different parameters. Mm -hmm that take an input data and are able to perform many different layers of transformations on that data to be able to come up with a, a final output which has very high degree of accuracy. But it's very unsatisfying when we're not able to really explain what is going on in those millions of computations that led to that final result. That is a very human question to ask because when we uh, think of ourselves as making complex uh, decisions when we face with uh, multiple choices, we're able to articulate our thought processes and how we get to that final decision, which is very hard mm -hmm. to um, replicate in machines right now. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's a legitimate question to ask uh, uh, about the black box systems. But it would be unfair to say that um, that is an inherent uh, shortcoming or limitation of AI systems. On the contrary, uh, AI scientists uh, take that very seriously as a problem and a goal to, uh, to uh, work towards. And in fact, over the last five years, I would say this has been tremendous uh, progress this, the field has been making. You know, we started about um, 10 years ago when uh, the deep learning work started to catch on. But now we're able to actually disambiguate what different layers of those deep neural network, uh, what sort of knowledge representations they are developing and learning. Hmm. So uh, progress is being made to make those uh, black boxes a bit more trans uh, transparent. And I will also add to that that uh, with machine learning systems, with, with computer systems in general, it is actually at least possible to open up that black box and, trying, and try to diagnose uh, what's taking place over there and draw inferences and uh, interpretations from it, which is very hard. 
to do. It takes do. a while. Mm-hmm. It takes a long time, I'm sure. No, what I was going to say is that that is very hard, if not impossible, to do with human beings. Okay, okay. Um, one has to rely on um, trust yeah. uh, when, we, um, when we try uh, to certain from other people's behavior, you know, what might be going on in the mind. It's, mm-hmm. it's impossible to actually <laughs> yeah. decipher that. Yeah. So in a way, uh, AI systems are a bit more transparent, hmm. uh, or at least uh, amenable to uh, transparent, uh, transparency than uh, human beings are. And so uh, I just wanted to you know, point that out, that while it's very fair to ask about the issue of the computer systems being sometimes uh, being viewed as, as black boxes, there is actually, from a scientific uh, view, the opportunity to be able to really make them transparent and uh, clarify exactly what the decisions or the, the processes were towards a particular outcome. You talked about that kind of the history that AI has gone through different phases of growth and recession or, or, or something. And it made me think that they probably came up with a computer that could play tic-tac-toe and beat a human. And then it became playing a, a slightly more complex game, chess or Go, or the next thing is maybe self-driving cars. Is AI, does the definition kind of change? Has it changed over time? What impresses us as AI is, is now passe, or is that fair to say that, <laughs> that AI is... Absolutely. In fact, uh, there's a, a cynical uh, saying in AI that AI is is it whatever that hasn't already been done. Okay, okay. so <laughs> uh, every time there is a significant problem that AI is able to solve, we almost sort of move the goalpost and say, yeah. obviously this is, uh, there is a clear solution to this. Surely this cannot be AI. Hmm. So back when, um, you know, the first AI systems uh, using knowledge representation and predicate logic were used to solve, say, checkers. Mm -hmm. Or or when we had uh, IBM built Deep Blue to beat Gary Kasparov, Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. the grandmaster of chess. Uh, Those were, at the time, uh, perceived as the holy grails of artificial intelligence. And as soon as they were solved, everybody (laughs) basically agreed that this surely cannot be artificial intelligence. And same is the case when we think about um, solving problems like how do we use GPS systems to help uh, cars navigate uh, from one place to the other. Mm-hmm. And there's mm-hmm. a you know, popular algorithm called A-star search to be able to solve that you know, okay. point-to-point navigation problem. Yeah. And it's basically ubiquitous now. Yeah. Uh, and so the holy grails of AI have moved on. So there you are absolutely spot on that uh, our expectations of AI continue to evolve. But what hasn't really changed is the the notion that uh, AI really ought to be, when it comes to you know, replicating human intelligence behaviors, the, the need to be able to generalize from one context to the other, that still remains. The general AI okay. uh, vision and goal uh, remains. And I think that's something that we're still some distance from. Okay. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to see the progress being made in the field at the breakneck spe- uh, speed as it is. But uh, I think most experts in the field would agree that we are certainly some significant ways off from getting to that general AI goal. Yeah. So we haven't reached artificial intelligence, maybe, because this definition keeps changing. And it sounds like you were saying artificial intelligence would truly be to take different contexts and uh, and be able to adapt from different situation to situation. That's right. And there's a technical term that sometimes is used um, in AI called uh, supervised learning versus unsupervised learning that sort of gets to the heart of this. Supervised learning, um, particularly in the machine learning context, means that uh, the problem of uh, identifying patterns in data And to be able to say that what this particular pattern really means, we need human intervention, actually. Mm -hmm. And that's where the supervision comes in. So a human expert would say, 
uh, here's a lot of data and I'm going to label some subset of the data over here. Mm -hmm. Take the example of saying, you know, you've got yourself a collection of different colored balls, all right? So here are 10 balls and five of them are green, three of them are yellow, you know, and the rest are blue. Mm -hmm. That's human level annotation or labeling, okay. right? So now we can take data about that collection of balls to say, all right, let's take a picture of that or what have you. The data that you're getting from this part of the picture over here, then it becomes actually a pretty straightforward machine learning problem to say, this kind of data seems, is, is got this particular interpretation to it. Okay. And when I see data which looks, has similar characteristics, or signatures as what is called green balls can be labeled as a green ball. That is the paradigm in which most of machine learning actually works. Uh, it's called supervised training. Okay. But as you can, you know, anticipate over here, you know, the issue, the bottleneck is that we need that human intervention to be able to provide that labeling, yeah. that high level interpretation of the data in the you're, first place. You're guiding. Exactly. The, the human is an oracle over here, yeah. helping the machine learn that. Yeah. The machine has not learned on its own that there is such a thing as a green ball huh. or there is some representation of that data that could be interpreted as such. The task or, or the field that is focused on solving that problem is called unsupervised learning. And that gets to the heart of being able to replicate that very human ability or that very intelligence marker to learn peculiar patterns of the data itself, ascribe to it a label or a, a knowledge representation that can then be applied in a different context. Mm -hmm. And that this whole process itself of the learning without having much supervision is what has been eluding artificial intelligence as a field. And the, the best guess is that being able to solve that problem when will be the key that unlocks our achievement of general intelligence. Yeah. How far away are we? It's very hard to say. The progress is being made uh, very quickly, but you know, it's very hard to say that we will have general level intelligence in the next five years or the next ten years because okay. it seems like one of those things for which there will be uh, a breakthrough that happens tomorrow, next year, maybe never. We yeah. don't know. Uh huh. Uh huh. So I want to know about Saad Khan. Tell me about your background. What maybe inspired you to get into computer science in the first place when you were young? Growing up as a kid, I was always a um, science junkie, if you will. Big fan of um, Carl Sagan, watching his Cosmos series. Hmm. I just, um, I mean, the only TV that I really love to watch, except for, you know, um, anime was um, science documentary. So I always mm -hmm. was uh, attracted to you know, science, be it uh, cosmology, you know, biology, um, or, or even uh, technology, and, mm -hmm. and particularly uh, you know, computer science. Uh, one of my favorite authors um, in sci-fi, Arthur C. Clarke, and when I first saw um, Space Odyssey uh, 2001, mm -hmm. um, Stanley Kubrick's uh, movie, it just totally blew me away, right? The, not just the fact that it was just so scientifically plausible and accurately done and all of that. Um, the computer system in Odyssey, hell. Mm -hmm. um, how it demonstrated not just intelligence, but many very human behaviors of jealousy and sometimes uh, deception mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and so forth. And mm -hmm. to be able to uh, ascribe to a computer system, those kind of abilities uh, were fascinating to me. Um, so, uh, but that didn't mean that I just wanted to just jump into computer science um, you know, at the time, but it was one of the things that really fascinated me. It wasn't until I got to college that I really started taking computer science seriously. Yeah, 
my senior year thesis uh, for my undergrad, which, by the way, uh, was at a university in Pakistan where I actually grew up, Hulama Sakhan Khan Institute. Uh, my senior year thesis was uh, on building an AI system that replicated ant-like colony intelligence oh. in artificial you know, robots or bots, okay. which we simulated in a computer system. Sure. And so um, we essentially built, back in the day, it was actually, this was uh, 2003, <laughs> an artificial neural network wow. um, that was trained to uh, replicate ant-like behavior in a colony of bots in, in, by demonstrating intelligent behavior like foraging for food mm-hmm. or, or flocking behavior and the mm-hmm. like. Mm-hmm. And that uh, was really successful. Um, uh, that really inspired me to pursue a PhD in computer science. So. I applied for um, you know, a PhD program in the U.S. Um, in, in computer vision, and I got in and started working at the University of Central Florida mm-hmm. with um, you know one of the uh, the most um, influential uh, scholars in the field, Mubarak Shah. And a lot of my work was around how do we take visual data captured in multiple sensors, like multiple cameras and solve the problem of uh, tracking human behavior uh, in real time. And that's like a, you know, a particular uh, problem in computer vision uh, that, mm-hmm. that I worked on, publishing that. Um, uh, that's essentially how I really got going in computer science and in machine learning. Uh, incidentally, that happened to be the time where machine learning basically really started to get into uh, and, and exploding into a, a field that made huge impacts in AI as, uh, in general. And uh, I guess the timing was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Here I am. Now. And you did a lot of uh, like identification of facial recognition, kind of. So. Uh, not so much uh, facial recognition, but analyzing human facial expressions. Okay. Okay. Um, so one sort of subfield uh, huh. field in computer vision is to be able to develop algorithms that can understand human emotion as human beings do by you know, having face-to-face conversations. Hmm. So you can tell when somebody's smiling or scowling or looking unhappy or, hmm. or frustrated or what have you. And obviously machines are very dumb at that, yeah. or at least were uh, at some point, not so long ago. And so my work uh, was focused on actually being able to build machine learning based models that can take in visual data, videos essentially of people's yeah. faces and say, all right, what sort of emotion are they expressing over there? Huh. Wow. So you got your PhD in 2008 and I want to know what's changed since then. Well, a ton has changed in, in, in computer <laughs> yeah. science and machine learning or AI in general. You know, some of the, the common things that people refer to are things like the fact that we have cloud computing resources, um, an explosion of data to use, and all of that is true. Uh, to me, the biggest um, change has been the replicability um, of results, okay. which is a very scientific scientific thing yeah. um, when I was working on uh, you know, my PhD work the notion that uh, you can uh, build models which would work outside of just your own specific data sets and your own lab environments and share the data sets as well as code for the public to be able to replicate uh, your results uh, was unfortunately a little bit novel, <laughs> uh, but that has changed tremendously in the last 10 years. Um, it's uh, almost expected now that um, you can quickly share results, data sets, models uh, in an open source fashion, and they go viral. And you know that's in many ways how impact of your work is, is measured. <laughs> And that has significantly accelerated the pace in which I think the field has actually made progress, where one group uh, develops an incremental improvement on the state of the art on a particular kind of an algorithm. They share it to the community. A different group is able to replicate that result, make further enhancement to it rather than starting from scratch, as they would have to otherwise. The field 
as a, as a whole benefits. So that is a very, I think, uh, it, it's a great thing for, for science and it's a great thing for the field. What's the best part of your job, or what's what brings you the most satisfaction? I guess it really has to be that we're working on solving problems for which there isn't an existing solution. So we're really pushing the frontier over here. Um, I don't want to sound too boastful, but I generally believe that what my team and I are doing over here at ACT is at really the cutting edge of what's being done in the field at large uh, when it comes to the use of AI in, in education. Some of the problems that we're trying to solve over here, for instance, using multimodal analytics, you know, the combination of machine learning, natural language processing, computer vision, to measure and remediate collaborative problem solving skill gaps using online multiplayer games. Yeah. There's nothing like that yeah. that I know of that the community at large of the field at large is engaged in or using natural language generation tools like Sphinx to create new educational content. I think it's super exciting to be part of a team and a set of initiatives that are really groundbreaking. In addition, one of the strengths of ACT Next is the multidisciplinary nature of the teams within ACT Next and ACT at large and the close collaborations that take place between those teams. I have the advantage of brainstorming ideas with the team members who have expertise in psychometrics um, and learning sciences and so forth, and not just rely on, say, my own background in machine learning or, for instance, the expertise of uh, team members within the AIML team on coming up with solutions that actually many times require a multidisciplinary approach. And to add to that, this kind of high-risk, sometimes high-payoff, hopefully, uh, mindset and, and uh, approach really can only be incubated when there is an institutional support and appetite for that kind of risk-taking and out-of-the-box thinking. So having leaders like Alina von Davier, who champions ACT Next and its approach to problem solving, and even our CEO, uh, Martin Roda, who really has been a major uh, supporter of what ACT Next has been bringing to ACT, uh, has been a great boon for us and uh, helping us create really the safety net to fall back on when we actually end up uh, failing sometimes. Well, thank you, Saad. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. That's our show. If you'd like to find out more about some of the projects Saad's AI team is working on, like Sphinx, Craze Plus, or the CPSX project, please visit actnext.org. We'll sign off today with a clip from 2001 A Space Odyssey soundtrack. This is the Blue Danube. Thank you for listening. <laughs>